what we bring to you, are bringing to you today is the um, Resuscitation Academy teachings that uh, Dr. Hazen and I present across the nation. We did this in Taos last year, uh, Los Alamos the year before, and we're working on Santa Fe for this upcoming year. Uh, what this program is, is a uh, HA plus a little bit. So the, the concept is to do better CPR than what's required. Uh, we've worked really hard with our fire department here to uh, do this. And Dr. Hazen's been hugely beneficial to our department with uh, being able to teach a lot of this stuff. So what he's gonna present is the uh, science behind the hands, and then we'll talk about the importance of time afterwards. So, uh, thank you guys for having me. The, uh, no, no, it's not on. Is that uh, on? Just it? Oh, good. Helps to go to the O-N instead of the O-F-F. -F. Sorry. So, <laughs> the, uh, so uh, thanks for having me up. I've had the pleasure of uh, working up in Los Alamos for the last, uh, I guess, four years. And, and um, it's very exciting, actually. You have a very good community as far as it's a small community. It's, um, it has very good EMS providers, too. So I'm actually I'm very blessed to have the, the job that I do because there's good buy-in for doing better than, than what's required. And Chief Stone has done an amazing job. That's the reason that uh, you have such good outcomes as far as CPR within your community. And so I'm gonna basically go through until I, I um, go through the science behind CPR, why we do it, some of the changes that have been made through uh, science and doing better practices. And then the other thing that I really wanna harp on is how can we do better? So, and that involves the community. Uh, to have access to defibrillators, to have a community that knows the same CPR that the EMS providers are providing. I was so excited whenever um, the fire department actually, uh, uh, we got together and we went out to Baltimore where the Resuscitation Academy was because they had such good outcomes to learn what they're doing to bring back here. I was very excited, so much so that whenever um, I got back to work my shift in the emergency department at the VA, that uh, we changed the way we do CPR um, within the organization itself and our outcomes went through the roof. We went from very low um, uh, resuscitation levels to um, very high resuscitation levels. And so uh, it's amazing, you know, a lot of people think that pre-hospital providers learn from physicians. And in this case, physicians are learning from pre-hospital providers. And, and the outcome has been amazing. Your community has a very good uh, community. So is what I want to start with first is I've, I've basically going to give you some of the slides that we do at a resuscitation academy. And I took out a lot of the, the, a lot of the um, studies behind it. But if you ever want any of the studies as to why we do stuff, I'll be happy to provide you with all those resources. But I wanted to give you an idea that um, for the longest time, we did CPR the same way over and over. I, I make an analogy to, if anybody's on medications, um, one thing that I think providers do a poor job of is you get put on a medication and you're left on the medication. And pretty soon, you kind of forget that that's just your medication. You need to be reassessed, do you really need this medication? Because you may soon be having something else wrong and they're like, well, let's put another medication onto you. And because, you know, we know how to do this side effect. And then you gotta go back and look, you really need those medications. It's the same thing with CPR and medicine in general. Once we do something, why do we do it? And how can we do it better? And this has changed the way we do CPR dramatically. So I'm gonna walk you through some of these slides. And you guys can stop me at any time and I'm gonna try not to mess this up here. And as Chief Stone knows, I don't do technology well. So we're gonna try this here. So this is what I'm gonna tell you and what's up there on the board, okay? So CPR is one of two systems that affects your survival rate. Anybody know what the other system is if you're doing good CPR? What else can you add in CPR? What do they always ask you to go get if you, if you have one? Yeah, an AED, go get a defibrillator. So two systems that will help you tremendously. And I'm gonna show you some of the studies to give you the numbers to show why you need to have access to those, those systems. Measure, feedback, and improve. This is something that kind of went away with American heart as far as getting to a rhythm is you, you start doing your thing and you're doing it the same way all the time. But you didn't look to see how well you were doing it. So now we need to do those, those uh, measures. I wanna let you know that you have the American Heart, usually your CPR card is two years, right? 
Well, uh, same with pre-hospital providers. Chief Stone changed that. He said, you're going to test your performance every four months. That's what the paramedics do in the field. EMT basics, everybody gets their performance checked every four months. And it went through the roof, wouldn't you agree? Went from high quality CPR. Perception does not mean it, it equals performance. What you think is happening doesn't mean that that is what's happening. And that's what we're going to explore here. Interruptions in CPR decrease survival. Very well shown. This is how one of the mainstays of how we improved outcomes. Not meaning getting your heart back, but walking out of the hospital after a cardiac arrest. Um, other tasks distract from CPR. Um, what I mean by this is we used to focus on airway, breathing, circulation, ABCs. We don't do that anymore. We do compressions. Why? They're focused on the skill of intubation rather than getting that heart pumping. Get it loaded up. Start getting blood in that heart. So now we change that. We knock out a whole bunch of compressions before we ever worry about putting an airway or doing any task in there. Survival increased dramatically. Okay? So just as important as pushing the right depth on a chest, it's also just as important to let off the chest. Okay? Let the heart fill. And I'll go through some studies with that, show you what I mean. All right. So if you look at this little diagram here, everybody gets focused on, well, you need you know, all these advanced medications, you need advanced procedures, and what I'm telling you here today is that CPR is your building block for this. Without CPR, none of the other even has a chance. The other thing is, if you look at shock, that's the second most important thing. It used to be uh, shock was the first thing you should do. All the studies show that if you shock a heart that doesn't have blood in it, it doesn't do any good. Do the CPR and then shock. That's another thing that's changed, okay? So, Oxygen intubation, that's the third thing. Now put in the airway, getting the oxygen going. And I'll explain to you why in a minute, okay? Then you look at the drugs, epinephrine and vasopressin are two drugs there. There's actually a lot of studies coming out showing that epinephrine does not increase your survivability. That vasopressin does not increase your survivability. So things are changing. If you could do those uh, first two things, you've already got the building block for what needs to be a successful um, a successful return of spontaneous circulation, meaning the heart's doing it on its own, okay? All the other stuff, don't worry about. All it is is different medications, different things that you can do. What I want to focus on are the bottom two. So here's you some, some numbers, and some people like numbers, some people don't like numbers. So in the 1990 to 1993, shock first was the most important thing that you can do. And there's your outcome. So you have a 24.3% survival rate with just shocking first. They got to looking at all the data, and then they looked, and they said, between 1994 and 1996, they said, why don't you do CPR first? Your outcome improved, okay? So now you have an improved outcome. You're thinking, well, that's not a very big difference. It is if you're the one having the heart attack, right? You want a point one one. you know, you want some chance of improving. That's why not combine the two. All right. So what this is, and even people that aren't medical providers, um, I can, I can walk you through this. So there's something called ventricular fibrillation. So if you get out a, a shock box or an AED or whatever you call it, it'll only shock two rhythms. It shocks V-fib and V-tac. So those are the rhythms that it recognizes. Other rhythms, it won't shock. But that's what's been shown that you can improve their survival rate. So, so what this is, as you can see, which is the laser point, on the left it says initial V-fib at one minute. You see the middle one, it says V-fib at 10 minutes with no CPR. And it shows V-fib at 13 minutes with CPR for three minutes. Okay, you're gonna have to just, if you're not a medical provider, you're gonna have to bear with me on this and take my word for it. That middle rhythm is very hard to come back from because it's starting to look like a straight line, right? Everybody knows even on TV that straight line's bad because you hear that, that means there's no waveform at all, right? That middle one's getting very close to a straight line. Do you guys agree? If you look at the one on the right, it looks almost the same as the one minute. The difference is, is there a CPR performed? The middle one, there's no CPR performed. Okay, so these are studies, and I'm not gonna go into all the details of the study. I'm just reassuring you that CPR improves your electrical activity of your heart, okay? All right. So here are the three guys that are credited with CPR. Okay, so as you can tell, the outfits haven't changed at all, but the technology has, right? So they always know if I'm going to a funeral or a wedding, I wear a tie. Um, 
but I hardly ever wear one. That's why I went to emergency medicine, so I wear pajamas every day. So, but if you look at this, they observed that whenever they put these heavy electrode pads on the chest that they um, were getting um, improved arterial blood pressure. Now keep in mind, these are not the little foamy ones. If you've ever messed with a defibrillator, these are heavy plates, like quarter inch steel plates. And they recognized that, what is this about being able to do CPR? These are the ones that are credited for doing the CPR. So basically, your heart sets within an area that's very closed space. That's why CPR works so good. You press on the chest, where does the heart go? It gets stuck between the, the spine, and then you have lungs on each side. So every push on the chest, blood flows out of the heart. You let go, blood flows into the heart, okay? All right, so here's just what I tell you. Compression, you increase the pressure in the chest, it pushes the blood out of the heart, okay? You let go, whenever you come off the chest, you're letting blood fill back into the heart. So, used to, they always worried about compression. They never worried about the relaxation part. Well, the thing about it, I'll show you in a few slides, whenever you relax and you come off the chest, that's the time that the heart fills with blood, okay? When you do the compression, it pushes blood out to your organs. Well, whenever you relax, that's when the heart fills with blood. That's why letting off the chest is just as important as pushing on the chest. All right, this is a pretty technical slide, but I leave it in here for a reason, okay? So if you see in the middle there, it says compression, okay? And then if you see on the other side, it says decompression. So if you look at them, they're, all they're measuring is pressure within the chest. So you push on the chest, you increase the pressure, right? That should make sense. If it doesn't, you can come up to me and talk to me afterwards, but um, you basically, you put pressure on the chest, it's going to increase the pressure in the chest. You let off the chest, it lets the pressure off. So it's what it shows is, if you see in the bright red block box that says aorta, whenever you let go of that, the, the, uh, you're letting the pressure go off from the organs, you're letting it go into the heart, okay? So it's what you're gonna find is where people start getting tired with CPR, is they start leaning on the chest, right? So they're doing compressions, getting tired, right? It's hard bending over, so you start leaning on the chest. Well, now you're not letting the, the blood fill go back into the heart. So now the heart's getting no blood at all. Does that make sense to you guys? So, don't worry, we'll summarize all this all at the end. So don't worry about the technical aspects of it. So, all right. So this is a journal in circulation that says you should suppress, you compress the chest uh, two inches, and that seems to be the magic number. Now, people try to make CPR really hard, and here's what I tell you with CPR. People always ask, well, how far do I need to go? Like, how do I know if it's an adult, if it's a child, if it's an infant? It's very easy. For an adult, how many hands do you use for CPR? Do you use one or two? Use two. So how far do you go in on the chest? Two inches. So if you have a small adult, you use one hand, right? How far do you go in? One inch. You have an infant, you use half your hand. How far do you go in? Half an inch. So make CPR easy, okay? All right. So this is all that's saying is that we know that you need to go in for, for two inches. You need to get about 100 beats per minute, okay? All right. This here, don't worry about the articles in there. This is basically telling us that what we were doing and what we thought we were doing, does not, they're not equal. That uh, there used to be, and no offense to anybody, but the medical community is a little bit jaded. And you would have people saying, I did CPR for 30 minutes, you know? And that used to make you a hero for doing CPR 30 minutes in an ER where you have a ton of staff. Does anybody know how long you can go before your CPR quality falls off? And you see a three minute, anybody else? Two minutes, yeah. 10 minutes, all right. Two minutes went. So all the studies show that at two minutes, you are fatigued. And it's what you're doing is you're leaning on the chest. So what does the fire department do? They have one guy that just stands there with a stopwatch. And he goes, you get about a minute, 45 seconds in, he starts prepping the other guy. Hey, it's counting down. Is what they do is they physically remove the other guy doing compressions so that they can get in there. Because what I'm going to show you coming up, you interrupt CPR, you start all over again. These guys are genius. Doc, uh, Chief Stone's done a very good job of getting the total interruption times down to a bare minimum. How would you say in a 45-minute code, how, would you, how much time do you think they'd be off the chest? Yeah, 
40 seconds. 40 seconds. So you figure that, but what used to happen? You see it on TV all the time. We were guilty of it in the ER. You want to do a pulse check. Oh, let's check for a pulse. Time goes by, right? Pretty soon you don't realize it. Or you start charging your defibrillator because you're going to deliver a shock. That thing starts, you know, powering up. You would think that the person, you know, you you would think they had some awful disease. People would clear out of the room thinking that the electricity is going to jump out of the machine and shock them. I'll tell you this, some services are continuing uh, chest compressions while the defibrillation happens. They, all the studies show it's not as bad as they thought whenever you're doing touching a patient and you deliver a shock. So that being said, they're minimizing the time that they're off the chest. It's very nice, the technology that's out there. Chief Stone could give me a, a full code. I can tell exactly when the chest compressions come off. I can tell you how deep the compressions were. They are completely scrutinized for every time somebody's heart stops. And they're held accountable for that too, okay? All right, so this is just another study. And if you've ever, if, with American Heart, you hear, well, is it 15 and two? Is it 30 and two? Like, do you do 15 compressions and two ventilations? They used to say, eh, it doesn't matter. Do, you know, 15 and two is good. But what I just told you is it does matter, right? So if I do 30 and two compared to 15 and two, there's less time that I am off the chest, okay? So here's you to, something that can make it a little bit um, more visual for us visual learners. So this is like a 15 and two compression ratio, or actually that one's 30 and two, right? Let's see here. Yeah, the 30 and two. So if you look at it, whenever you, you see that there's not the scribbly lines up there, that's hands off the chest. That's when CPR is stopped. And then you can see the lightning bolt. That means they delivered a shock. Okay, so that's what the average is, 150 compressions per two minutes. Now look at that. There's a lot more compressions going on, wouldn't you agree? So there's not many pauses within there, and you're getting a lot more compressions. Now you have 200 compressions in a two minute. Before you saw 150 compressions. And I tell you, the science shows continuous compression CPR, high quality compression CPR is gonna save a life. Combine that with a defibrillator, and I'm gonna show you what your odds increase to. All right, shock pauses and cardiac arrest survivability. So if you look at the bottom there on the graphs, it says maximum pause in chest compressions. So if you look on the left, it's less than 10 seconds. The next one's greater than 20 seconds, okay? So if you look at those two, you see the one that has the less than 10 seconds, your, your chance of survivability increases much more than if you go greater than 20 seconds, okay? So the whole goal is the least amount of time. So then if you look over there and you see, um, greater than uh, 40 seconds on the far right. As you can see, it's 20% compared to 35%. All right. You guys good with that? Moving along. So that whole slide tells you the less time off the chest, the better off you're gonna be. I'm sorry, Doctor, mm -hmm. I don't know what peripause is. Oh, so peripause, so let's see if I can go back here. Okay, so. Yeah, so all that is is like whenever they're, they're start charging up the defibrillator, you're, you're around the time of shock, and then you're allowing the defibrillator to, to juice up. So on the movies, it's actually pretty accurate. They, they push, okay, we're gonna shock. So they push the charging button, and you hear it go Pretty soon it goes and it lets you know that you're there. The buttoning lights up. That does have a lightning bolt on it, and, and you know. So it's what people were doing is they are coming off the chest while that thing was charging up. And we realized, why? It's not going to shock you. You have to actually push that button to go. So they're not stopping while it charges is all that is. Yeah, it's, yeah. And, and unfortunately, it's taken a little while for a lot of this to catch up like um, with their training. But yeah, they usually do tell you to go ahead and come off while that thing charges. I'm telling you that we changed the way we did things. And that's what gives us such a good hands, uh, low time for hands off the chest. Yeah, so and then, but then you still want to make sure everybody's off the patient whenever they do deliver the shock. So that's the main thing. Make sure everybody's off. Even though it's not like you see on the movies where somebody's arm is brushed up against somebody's leg and they give it the shock and the person falls down and now they're in cardiac arrest, it's not, not going to happen. So, and I'll rest assure you that I'll tell you one of my mess ups. You know, I believe um, messing up is a good way to learn, especially if it doesn't hurt somebody. But um, I had a guy collapse whenever I was in Albuquerque and I had a defibrillator in my car 
and the guy, we're filling up at the gas station, and uh, the guy drops right next to me. He goes, I don't feel good. He drops. So I pull out my defibrillator. I go over. He was in a shockable rhythm. He gets shocked, and he, and he returns. His pulse comes back, and everything's good. Didn't think about much until the fire department shows up, and the engine crew gets out, and the, the paramedic comes up to me, and he goes, hey, Doc, how are you? And I said, oh, I'm good. And he goes, man, that was a gutsy move. And I was like, what? What do you mean? I was like, yeah, I shocked him. came back. He goes, yeah, I never seen anybody get shocked at a gas pump. And I was like, oh, that's a good point. Probably static electricity combined with, you know, that probably was not the wisest idea, you know. So the guy who survived his cardiac arrest and died from, you know, third degree burns from my, you know, my blowing up a gas station in Albuquerque. So, but that proves the point that the static, the, stat the charges you got from that did not set off the gas pump. I wouldn't recommend you doing that. And I was still filling my truck whenever I did it. So anyway, hindsight is 20, 20 All right. So the likelihood of return to spontaneous circulation in the medical field, we always refer to this as ROSC. It means that the heart is now beating on its own. So you're not having to do anything. You feel a pulse. You're not doing compressions. So all right. So if you're visual learners, again, I like graphs. So. If you look over there in the green, it says ROSC. So that means their heart returned to a normal beat, generating a pulse after CPR. On the right, where it's in red, it says no return to spontaneous circulation, meaning that they did not um, regain a pulse. So if you look at it, it's what it's showing on the left-hand side. It shows how many compressions per minute, like how many times did they press on the chest in one minute. Their range is 95 to 138 compressions per minute. And as you see it start going down, 87 to 94. Once you start getting to where you're only compressing at the bottom, about 40 to 72 compressions per minute, look at your survivability rate. It's only 42% compared to 75%, okay? So meaning that you need to get, you know, at least 100 compressions in in a minute to increase your survivability rate. Okay. So this is kind of a summary slide. So better compressions lead to better organ perfusion, meaning that you're not going to get tired. Now, if you're the only one doing CPR, you have to keep going. It's just you. But what amazed me is what never clicked to us is why is it that we have an emergency room full of providers and we're letting somebody do compressions for 30 minutes? It, it, was, it was, honestly, it was stupid of us. It was, it was something that, you know, didn't even click until... We go to the resuscitation academy and they're like, look at this science. Why, you know, why didn't I see that science before? We changed it and now in the emergency department we have a clock. So every two minutes it goes off. It gives us a beep. It actually gives us a beep 10 seconds before it goes off and then it beeps, meaning that the next person needs to get up there and get ready to go with some compressions. It completely changed our survivability rate in the emergency department. They're doing it in the field. They're more religious at it, I would say, than even us in the emergency department. They have the right number of personnel. The problem with emergency departments, you can have too many people, right? Out there, they have the right number of people. And they get to discuss it before their shift. So they're going to go out there, and engine company is a perfect person to do it. They say, you're up first on compressions, you're second, you're timing, and you're going to be doing the, the whole, running the whole thing. So they discuss it before they go out. So we started doing that in the emergency department. Hey, somebody's heart stops, you're first up. Why aren't we discussing it? They're doing a great job. We're learning from them. Two inches is the key, so get the right depth in there. Remember, two hands, two inches on an adult. And letting off the chest is just as important as compressing the chest. Okay. All right. This one, this one we, we've already gone over, but we'll skip it. So whenever we talk about coronary perfusion, this is what we were talking about, that you must let off the chest. Coronary perfusions means that the blood's getting the heart, uh, getting to the heart. And this is what we showed earlier. The thing that we added in is on the decompression, you can see the brain, and you can see the uh, heart below it. So that's what, that's what you want to perfuse, the brain, the heart, kidneys. You want to perfuse all your organs, naturally. But whenever you let off and you decompress the chest, you're starting to get increased perfusion for the heart. Okay? Um, basically, I just told you all that again. So. I already told you this, do pauses and compressions make a difference? You want to do as many compressions without interruption as possible. 
So if you look at this, it's uh, basically a graph that shows successfully resuscitated seconds of interrupted CPR. If you look at the 100%, this is a study, three seconds of interrupted CPR. Look at the survival rate, 100%. Look at 10 seconds of interrupted CPR, 80%. 15 seconds of interrupted CPR, 40%. 20 seconds of CPR, you basically are you know, at a 2% level. So another study showing that you just need to not interrupt your CPR. All right. This is to further drive home that point. So you have 30 compressions. It's what you're seeing is you're seeing a buildup of pressure within the system. Whenever you get over onto the right where it says pause CPR, look how quickly your pressure drops off. So it's what I'm telling you is that once you stop doing CPR, all the work that you've done to build up the pressure within the heart is now gone. So that's why we minimize our, our pulse checks. And be honest with you, the EMT basic, so you have a basic, an intermediate, and a paramedic. Well, this was uh, probably, I thought it'd be harder for them to swallow, but basics run the code. The basic EMT runs the code. And the reason they do is they own CPR. So paramedics had a little bit of issue with that, right? Well, I went to more schooling. I run the code. And so we thought it'd be a harder issue. Chief Stone did an amazing job. He basically said, look, here's the studies. Here's what happens. Paramedics love it. The reason they love it, they need to be focusing on medications, procedures, intubations, IVs. And so they can focus on their other job while the basics run the code. But it's funny to watch a basic tell a paramedic, and the paramedic said, we're gonna do a pulse check. He goes, in 60 more compressions. And they, they swallow their pride, and they, they realize that they wanna have the best outcome for this patient, and they do. So. All right. So the effects of medication. So we see this all the time, um, more in the hospital setting. So you give a medication. You get so focused on giving medication you realize nobody's doing CPR. You gotta circulate the medication. If you do high quality CPR, you circulate the medicine even better because you keep the pressure high within the heart. The medicine does no good if it just sets in the vein, right? You wanna do the compressions. So, so you gotta have good CPR in order to circulate any medication that you're giving. Okay, so if you go back, we did that little upside down triangle before. And some different stuff, this one here, it says HP CPR, that's high performance CPR, meaning that you're doing a very good job of doing this. Is there a better way? Who knows, maybe I'll be coming to you in 10 years from now saying, hey, whether well, we're gonna add this to it. So we're, we're looking at it. So the compression rate's important, the depth of compression. And like I told you before, these, the, the EMT providers that Chief Stone has have very high scrutiny. The whole time that they have that monitor on the, on the patient, we know how fast they're going, the depth they're going, what the rhythm looks like, how effective their compressions were, when they gave a medication, when a shock was delivered, and we get it, in, and I can get it in real time. So another nice thing about technology, it can go to my smartphone. Whenever they transmit an EKG, I get it at the same time. So we could actually, Ben Stowe's done a great job of putting together a quality improvement program, and they're scrutinized, and these providers take it to heart. They want to do well. They want to score that 100% on their compression rate. They want to score, you know, 100% um, on their death rate. But most importantly, they want to be able to see somebody walk out of the hospital because this is their community and they're people they know, they're their loved ones. So they want to do well. So my goal with this in Chief Stone is, why don't we have the community trained in CPR, right? High quality CPR, not just doing CPR, but why don't we do it where everybody knows how to do it really, really well. Science demonstrates that return of spontaneous circulation increases when CPR reporting according to the guidelines. We're changing those guidelines to make it even better. Minimal pauses, full compression, full recoil, and then along with adequate contrap, the depth and, and rate. So we want it to be perfect, okay? We're very picky. Oh. Um, this is just a summary of everything I already told you, so we're gonna skip through it. This is a funny slide, everybody, in V-fib survives, they should survive because that's a shockable rhythm and so that's what we're, we're striving for. Okay, so pick one improvement to work on. So my, my thing is that we're optimizing the EMS, so now let's optimize the community. Let's give people access to defibrillators. Let's give people access to advanced CPR. Let's change how we're doing things and really demand that it could be 
one of us that's being performed on. It could be one of us that, that needs the CPR. The guy in Baltimore, what's his name? Chief Brothers. What is it, like a week after they did their training? He uh, walked out of the fire station, wasn't feeling well, and suffered a massive cardiac arrest. And so they tell you that at the end of the presentation. It was already a great presentation, but whenever he goes up there and he says, by the way, I had high-performance CPR administered to me at the end of my shift on a, uh, you know, at the fire station in the driveway. And so right then, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it, but right there it proves that that guy is very motivated to be there because he's there because of the changes that were made. So practice not make perfect, only perfect practice makes perfect. Vince Lombardi. So. All right. Do you want to talk in between or you want to go into this? So we teach this, like I said, across the country. And part of what we wanted to bring to you guys today was the importance of the community piece. So Dr. Hazen did a fantastic job of describing what we're doing in the fire service here in Los Alamos to, to increase survival. There's a thing called uh, death by zip code. It's a, it's a common kind of term or theme that you can hear throughout the country. Chief Brothers had crossed over from Baltimore into Howard County where he works. Baltimore doesn't do this system. He may not have survived if it was a Baltimore firefighter versus the Howard County doing the CPR because they're doing the, the not so wonderful CPR still. They haven't moved to this new high quality system where we test them constantly and make sure that we're hitting these high benchmarks and continually hitting those benchmarks. We've had this program for four years and in that four years we've not had a single test of any of our employees, 150 uh, firefighters, be under 90%. When we first tested them, they, they almost killed me. Uh, the first set of tests were in the 30 and 40% range and they thought I was cheating them uh, with the numbers. But then we taught them the, the correct way to do CPR and saw that increase and now they, uh, if we miss a training, they, they email the doc and I uh, and tell us that they want to make it up because they want to be so good at what they're doing. The piece that we need help with though is relevant to it takes, no matter how fast we drive, no matter how fast we get the dispatchers to dispatch us, it takes us six minutes to get to you anywhere in Los Alamos, on average six minutes. So you looked at those numbers, what was the percentage of survival at 10 minutes? Four or 5%. So that's really where we were reaching out to our community and teaching CPR almost everywhere we can. We taught 500 high schoolers this year, uh, in the last month, how to do high quality CPR. And this is where we can get you guys to come back and say, we wanna do this in our workplace and, and be able to do CPR and teach as many people as we can to be able to reach these marks. So our next slide set is the importance of time. Dr. Hazen is gonna talk about those gaps and where you guys really can help us fill some of that six minutes with doing high quality CPR. Even if it's the best you can do and you have to do all six minutes, something's better than nothing. So I'll leave it back to you, thank you. Yeah, so this is one thing I'm gonna stress is the importance of time. And that's where we need the community involvement in this. If we can get somebody that gets a defibrillator or if we have um, a, community that has a lot of defibrillators within their community and they have access to it and we can get that first shock before the fire department gets there, we can get CPR going before the fire department gets there, it increases survivability rate. They're at that golden time to have it done. So now that we're optimizing our, our side of the house, we want to extend it out to help us and to help your community because if we can cut those time intervals out, I'm going to show you how we cut time down and how we still need to improve on it, but we're really maximizing our time. So this is the importance of time. There's only about 12 slides here, but I wanna show you, uh, oh my goodness, I hope I didn't hit the, the button on the back. Okay. I probably did. I got all excited, I think. Can you make it go forward? Yeah, just a second. <laughs> all right. The one button they told me not to hit, I think I hit it, so. Anyway, so I can start without this. So the um, one I want to stress to you is that, so if you look at how a dispatch system works, the nice thing is your dispatch system here is amazing. They have, uh, they'll get, walk you through CPR, they'll count for you. It's a very cool system to work within. So, so they know CPR, they're all trained in CPR, and they even have a worse job because they have to tell somebody that they can't see how to do something. They, they have to work without that visual stimulation. So is is what they do is, the other thing is if you look at a graph from the time the cardiac event occurs to the time that help comes, it's a straight line. 
It's a straight line on this graph that goes down. So you want to affect that. So the way that you affect it is you want to have, when the, the time starts when the hot heart stops, right? It's not when the call comes into 911. It's whenever the heart actually stops. So if you have somebody that's training CPR, you can start doing CPR. But then we looked at where, where can we improve? So if a call goes into 911, we're already behind the curve, right? And so if it takes three minutes to dispatch out the call, how well are we doing? We're not doing well at all. Our goal is to have that thing dispatched out, the call dispatched out in under 60 seconds. And they're hitting those marks. So what happens, you go to call, so you call 911 and you say, my neighbor just fell, I don't think he's got a heartbeat, I don't think his, his heart's going. So it's what they're doing, they're automatically handing that off to their next dispatcher, and they're saying, tone it out. So they have the address, they tone it out. So while they're getting more information, they're well under 60 seconds now, and the fire department's already rolling, okay? So we, we, we affect that curve. So now we cut down to a minute, but normally it was taking three minutes, we now have down to one minute. Is it going? Oh, thank you, thank you. And I won't touch the button again, I promise. So, so here's a few annex. And, the great healer or the great destroyer is time, right? So what do you do when you sprain an ankle? What do they tell you it need to heal? You just need time to let it heal. However, as you start getting older, time is the reason that you're needing more medical stuff. So it could be the healer or the great destroyer. So measure life in years, but resuscitation in seconds. That's what we're talking about. We want to cut down this. We're talking about those seconds. Life is infinite. Death is eternal. Between the two is about 10 minutes, all right? So we want to really focus on those 10 minutes, what we can do. All right. So if you look at this graph, percent survival to, to, by time to CPR. So if you look at the bottom, it's the number of minutes. And then the left side is the percent survival. So if you get somebody with, and these are all out of studies. I just took the studies off. So if you get one minute um, after their heart stops, you have CPR started, you're already at a 45% survivable rate. Okay. So if you look at two minutes, you're dropped down to 35 and then as you start going down, you get to 10 minutes, you're now, well, you're below 10% survival rate, okay? This is off one study, but all the studies that we accumulated are consistent, that they show that the sooner you get CPR going, the better off you're gonna be. That's all that slide tells you, okay? Now let's look at the sur survival rate to first shock. So you look at the bottom, again, it's minutes, and then you put percent survival on the left, and you percent survival by time to first shock. So if you get a first shock in there within three minutes, you're at about 55%, okay? Now, four minutes, you're at 60%. There's this weird variation, I don't know why, all of a sudden it goes up for a minute later, but if you plot the line, it basically goes, it's a downsloping line, okay? But what about if you, if you combine the two? That's where we're going with this. All right, so another one. So if you look at time to first shock is on the top, and then if you look at the the one on the left, it's time to CPR. So if you get a first shock in within eight minutes and you get CPR within that zero to four minute, you're looking at a 64% survival rate. That's good, you know? A lot of people are thinking, well, it's not as good as 75%, but where we're going, if we can improve this, that's what we want to do. And then you can see the, the digression in it. So if you look at just time to shock, that first one, you go across there, nine to 12 minutes, you drop to 41%. Greater than 13 minutes, you drop to 30%. Same thing with if you look at time to CPR, 0 to 4 minutes, 64, 5 to 8, 49%, and in this study, greater than 9 minutes, there's no data because nobody survived, okay? So if you look at, uh, if you combine the two, then as you can tell, once you get down to 13 plus minutes and greater than 9 minutes of uh, CPR, then basically you're looking at 0% survival rate. So the whole goal is combine your CPR and combine your, uh, your defibrillation and you stand a much better chance at survival, okay? So this is what I was talking about whenever, um, waiting for the slides to come up. If you look over there on the, the PSAP, that's, whenever, that's the dispatch center. The first PSAP means that the first time the 911 call comes in. The second one where you see uh, the PSAP, that's when the call goes to the fire department, okay? So the call comes in on the 911 operator, that's the first, First tone. Second tone is when I send it out to the fire department. You look at the process time, that's the amount of time that it takes to, um, to send the, the call out. Turnout time is the amount of time it gets for the fire crews to get in, the, in their apparatus and get moving. Travel time to the scene, at scene. It takes a while to get into people's houses, apartments, and then by the time you get at the patient and you do CPR, 
There's a lot of moving parts in this. Okay, we'll break it down here for you. So call to 911, dispatch time. So now you're sending it out. Rollout time is the amount of time it takes them to get to their units and moving down the street. The arrival at the patient, time to the patient, time to see, arrival time means to the scene, time to the patient, time to CPR, and time to defibrillation. So just think about this. It's much harder to get the defibrillator on first too, right? You gotta pull the pads out, you gotta turn it on. What can you do instantly? You can do CPR. That's what we train people to do, and that's what you need before you shock anyway, okay? All right, the slope of death, straight line. So it's what, you, what you're gonna see on the next few graphs is how we've cut out the time to maximize the chance of survival. If you look at the number of minutes on the bottom, chance of survival, um, on the right, it's a straight line. So, if you look at the time to dispatch, so about two minutes. So the call comes in, you wait a couple of minutes because you gotta get the address, gotta confirm the address, you're just doing it yourself, you're not having somebody help you. Roll out time, that's the time it takes the fire department to get to their apparatus, get things moving. At scene, so that, in that yellow section there is the travel time. At patient sides, it takes about a minute and a half because you figure they got to stop their truck, they got to get their stuff out, they got to go up to your house, make sure they can get in. That gives at least a minute and a half. And then you look at the HP, that's high performance CPR. So where are you at? You're at eight and a half minutes now. Okay, eight and a half minutes. So how can we change this slope? That's what we want to know. How can we make this better? Because if you look at your percent survival, you're already below 20%. Okay, that's when the fire department gets there. They have all this training and all this, you know, they do good quality CPR, but how can you make, how can you help them out? So this is what we did. So, and there's your defibrillation time. So, let's look at it again. So dispatch, two minutes to dispatch. Rollout time, it's the same. Just taking, it's the same as the first slide there. I haven't changed anything yet. So that one. Now you notice there's a deflection change in the curve. So what that is, is dispatcher aided CPR. This is dispatch now saying, you need to do compressions and I'm gonna walk you through it. Do you have a defibrillator? Do you have somebody that can go get it? They're starting the process. Pull them off the bed and they walk them through it. They're doing, if you're, if you're ever on a 911 call and you're doing CPR with them, if you're going too slow, they will make you speed up. They'll say, you need to go faster. I'm gonna count with you. Every time I count a number, you need to do a compression. One, two, three, four. And they walk them through it, okay? So this changed the deflection of your curve. So look what it did to your survivability rate. This was one change. Have a, have a dispatch walk you through CPR, okay? At scene, still it's the same, nothing changed on that. That patient's side, still eight and a half minutes to the patient's side. They take over high performance CPR. So you see a little bit of deflection in there because the deflection is, is that the guys who do it all the time are gonna do a little bit better high performance CPR. And defibrillation. You now went from below 20% to a 35% survival rate, making one change. And that's having the dispatch give you CPR. Let's make some more changes. All right, look at that, rapid dispatch. Before it was a three minute dispatch time. Now we're going to a one minute dispatch time, okay? So that means they get the call, they realize it's cardiac arrest, they have their partner help them out. Still takes about one minute to roll out for a fire crew. Dispatch aided CPR. At scene, still same distance for this. At patient size, still take it a minute and a half. But look at your survival rate now, 40%. You went up 5% from the prior slide. So the only thing that was different in there is you changed your dispatch time. You still, it's still three, you know, before it was three minutes to get everything out, now it's two minutes to get things out. All right, defibrillation. So it's what that whole slide was trying to tell you is that we have now cut our dispatch time down to one minute or less. So you get the call in, their partner dispatches it out. That's given us more time. So we can't change the amount of time it takes to roll a, uh, an engine out. So it, a minute's a great job. You figure they're doing other stuff, they can get in their truck and get moving at a minute, that, that's national standard, they're, they're there. And then we can't change the amount of time it takes you to get there. However, the changes that we did make, dispatchers are given CPR directions. So now CPR started. If you remember all the prior slides in that, CPR getting it started early is the most successful thing you can do. They're trained in high quality CPR. They go to our resuscitations academies. They're certified in CPR. And then 
On top of that, if you have a community with defibrillators in it, you now have sooner defibrillation time, sooner CPR time, you change the time. So we've kind of, we're at our maximum availability for EMS to do much better on their time, on their quality. So now we have to send it out to the community. And that's what the selling is. If we can get businesses to invest in, C in defibrillators, if we can get businesses to train people in CPR, it's free training. You know, there's grants out there to help with, with defibrillators and stuff. Um, but that's the main thing. And that's what we're asking for is the community to buy in. We're at our maximum point. I'm telling you, they're highly efficient providers. Now we need the community to buy in and say, hey, what more can we do? How can we help change this line? If the defibrillator and all those prior slides, the defibrillator was by the fire department. It wasn't by the community. If we can put those in the community, bam, now you change that line dramatically. So their return to spontaneous circulation rates, what were they originally before the resuscitation academy? No, for here. 14 or 15%. It's still above the average, which is about 10%. And But you're thinking, before all this, what is it now? 50? You say 50? Yeah. So 50%. So you go from basically 12% to 50? I mean, that's good. So, and, and, and that's the thing. And the whole reason that that happened is they bought into it. I bought into it. And, and we have the numbers to prove it works. All the studies show it worked. We're like, why not try it in our community? And it worked. So people are walking out of the hospital, and they're walking out alive, and they're walking out with, you know, without deficits like they were before. And the other thing that I'm assuring you is we're, we're going to continually watch this. We have a huge quality assurance program in place. All these things are reviewed immediately. The uh, Chief Stone gets them right away. He sends them to me. He's like, hey, this is what, what we had happen. This is the percent. The, the crews know their feedback. And, and they're not competing against numbers. I don't want you to get that idea that, well, the crews are like, well, I scored at 95%, you know, and stuff. And they're proud of that because they know it makes a difference in patient outcome. So it's not that they're, they're competing to be the best. Their, their ultimate uh, satisfaction means that that person survived or that they walked out of the hospital. And I'm a firm believer that when it's your time, it's your time. And nothing that anybody's gonna do is gonna change that. But if there is a chance of survival, we want it to be the highest. And if you go to a community, the nice thing with a small community, you can affect a big change. I'm very excited that, that students out of the high school are coming out with CPR training. If I had my way, it would be a requirement. You have to come out before you graduate high school. I care less about your you know, MCAT, CCAT, SCAT, whatever they have now. You know, I want to know, can you do CPR? Can you stop bleeding for somebody that has a bleed? That's what I want to know. If you figure that if you start doing that community and make it a requirement, Figure what it would be like in 10 years in your community after you turned out 10 years of people out of your high school. Figure 20 years. Pretty soon you have a, a community that's trained in CPR, that, that's trained in stopping the bleed, and, and it would make a huge difference in your community. It's harder to do it in big communities, but in smaller communities, that's where it's going to be. And we always, I always used to laugh, like, you know, when I worked at, at UNM, I did all my training at UNM, like, I always thought I was, I was the gold standard. You know, and I'd get, I'd get people in from rural communities and I'd be like, why do they do this? Like, it doesn't make sense. And so I left that, left that mentality at UNM and I went and I worked in um, Farmington and then I went to Tootencary. So in Tootencary, I realized why people do stuff because I was the only doctor out there and it made a difference. But the thing that was interesting, if I put on a training in Albuquerque, I would get hardly any participation. I put a training on for EMTs in a rural community, it would be packed. And I'm like, why is it this way? And I realized they have really long transports and they're the only person for a long time. They need the most training. There, you know, if there's an accident in Albuquerque, I guarantee you there'll be six medics on that scene, okay? If you get an accident in Tomb Carry in Quake County, there's only one EMT paramedic. And it depends on if she's on or not, whether you're not gonna get, you're gonna get a paramedic that day. And so that's why I really want to focus training in rural communities. They're the ones that need it the most of anybody. So that's all I got to say. So Chief Stone. You guys all have a, a card. So if you have any questions that you want to write down on those cards for us, and we'll field all the questions that you guys have. If you need medical CEUs, please make sure you see some of the Heart Council staff in the, in the hallway before you leave and, and fill out the uh, the follow up survey, our survey, so that you, we can do that. And we'll collect those, thank you. Go ahead. The late 70s in Los Angeles County, they were offering on TV within evening news a five minute CPR course, Monday through Friday, and then on Saturday you were good to go down to your local fire station and get tested out and I remember getting, I was in nursing school, 
I got in a big discussion or argument with one of my brother-in-laws. And he said, this is horrible. This is terrible. You know, if they do it wrong, they're going to break people's ribs or something like that. Sure. Said, yeah, but if they don't do it, right. the person dies. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, for so many people, they're not going to do anything until they've got that little, they're the card-carrying member. Yeah. I'll tell you, you bring up a very good point. That's why I was laughing. It was, so I'll give you two examples of that. So the first one is I, my big push also for schools is to have Stop the Bleed campaign. So I really think it needs to be in the schools. So I approached many schools in Albuquerque, and I got zero response until my daughter goes to Hope, and I, I, I basically said, hey, there's this, we actually, Hope allows us to use their building for for the SWAT team to do like active shooter training and stuff. So they allow the kids to say afterwards to be um, patients and victims and participate in it and the teachers. So after we did a training three years ago, um, one of the teachers asked me, he goes, will you show me how to put on a tourniquet? And I said, well, yeah, absolutely. And I said, if any other teachers want to know how, I'd be happy to come back. So within two days, I got 60 teachers. It's all the middle school. So I went back and the day that, well, Actually, I don't know if it was three years ago. You guys will know. So, the, uh, so I went back in the day I was doing the training when they had their shooting in Roswell. Teachers are very good because they have a vested interest in their students. They want to learn. They value education. And so, I mean, you talk about taking notes. They were, they were into it. So the next day, I get a notice at the high school. All 60 teachers want to go for the high school. So by the end of the day, so after 30 days, we had nailed every bus driver, janitor, uh, teacher, and they all knew how to do tourniquets and chest seals and how to stop the bleed. And how many, how many other schools do you think signed on for that? Because they got some publicity. Zero. No other schools want to do it because they think it won't happen here. Well, it's the same thing with the CPR card. They think, well, if I don't have that card, I can't act. The liability of doing it, you're covered under Good Samaritan. And the other thing, too, is that I'll give you another quick example. So when I was in, so in New Mexico, you can get your commercial driver's license when you're 18. So I was working for an oil field company in Farmington. And my boss came up to me one day and goes, you're gonna go get your CDL in two weeks. I said, yes, sir. He walked off and I look at my buddy and go, what's a CDL? And he goes, a commercial driver's license. Oh, well, sounds good. So they set up a little course and I, I go and I pass the test, okay? Well, it's the end of summer now, going into winter, I go to school, I come back during the winter. My first day, my boss tells me, hey, you got your CDL, so I've got a load for you to take. I said, oh, okay, sounds good, sir. So he gives me this load, it's a 60,000 pound trencher. I had to take eight miles between Bloomfield, New Mexico and Aztec, New Mexico. There's one hill between Bloomfield and Aztec. So I get in the truck and I hop in there and it was a brand new truck, still had plastic on the seat. My boss tells me, do not remove the plastic. It's a brand new truck, I wanna do it whenever we get back, okay. Well, the problem is I wasn't a truck driver. And so I get halfway up the hill, I forget what gear I'm in, it's, it's sliding. I was, and I know I'm not supposed to put it on the clutch, but at the end of the day, I push it on the clutch, I find a gear, and I let go, and I hear this <laughs> and an instant stop in the truck. I drop the drive line out of the truck. And so I get there, so I call my boss, and I'm like, hey, there's something wrong with the truck. He goes, huh. He shows up, and he can see the drive line sitting on the ground. It's over on the side in the gutter where the slush, and now it's starting to melt. And the mechanics show up. The load is too heavy to get the truck off, so they had to fix it on the hill. That's the first time I realized I was mortal. And the mechanic showed up and realized they were going to be laying in the slush and water. My boss told me, you stay here until they fix the truck. So I said, okay. So I'll not tell you what they told me, because it's not appropriate for this venue. But he, uh, so I realized I was going to die. And my boss told me, he goes, you get your, your keister in the truck and you drive it to where you're going. So I did. I drove it. He said, meet me in my office. I'm like, first job I can get fired from. I realized what that's going to be. I get there and he tells me how much the mechanics bill was, how much DOT fines were for blocking traffic. It was a two-lane road. They had to stop traffic and ride it around and, and learning experience. And at the end of the day, this is what he told me. He goes, just because you had that little piece of plastic, you thought you knew what you were doing. And that, that, le that lesson has, has stayed with me this whole time. Just because you go to a doctor doesn't mean they're a good doctor. It means they passed the test and they have the little plastic card. Same thing with this, and that's why they've gone away from the cards. They do the, the CPR training in stadiums now for hands-only CPR. You don't end up with a card. You end up with a completion certificate. But the whole moral of this story is that, you know, you don't need that card to do it. And you brought up a very good point. And think that was in the late 70s, and it's still around today that if you don't have that card. The other thing is, is that whenever I went to do the training for the schools, the fire department was originally scheduled to do it, Albuquerque Fire. 
I said, will you guys come in and teach this training? Sure. The day before, we had to cancel. Why do you think they told me they had to cancel? Liability. Yeah, so that's a good point. That wasn't brought up, but what was was that the fire department didn't want the liability if they put a tourniquet on wrong. So I brought up the same point. So which would you rather be? So now there's a school shooting, and you chose not to do the training. And I told the chief, and I sent him a letter, and I said, you're the worst person to be in Albuquerque right now. Why is that? Because you chose not to do anything whenever you could have made a difference. If, if, if you, so say that it's a litigious society, right? So say now we're in trial, and, and, um, and it's me who wanted to do the training and did it, and somebody did something wrong, or it's the fire chief, and he chose not to do anything. Who do you think the jury's going to side with on this? Me who tried? or him who chose not to push education out. And so that's why I give you training. Anything you want, free, I'll come do whatever. But I want you to have that knowledge and that education. Education is power. And that's the other nice thing about this community. It's a smart community. So that's why I'm up here trying to say, let's, let's get on board with this and make it happen. Suppose you have an ideal situation, one patient, two people who want to do it, and AED. So one starts suppression. So ideally you want to have at least 200 compressions in there. So you want to prime that pump, but I'll let the chief address it. So. 200 is what we're teaching with AHA now, so about two minutes of solid compressions. And we're teaching uh, civilians or, or, or people from the community to just do compressions and not do breaths anymore. Because that was the big fear, the secondary to litigation was, I don't want to put my mouth on somebody else's mouth. I don't know them. Uh, I'm good with that. This is just two compressions. But about two minutes is good. In the fire department currently, we're running six minutes. So we won't shock until we have six solid minutes of compressions on. And, the, and I'll say, show the reason is if you don't have any blood volume in the heart, then you're not going to do good. The other thing that's different, which the fire department does different is, so after they shock, used to, we would check for a pulse after that shock. We don't check. We continue with compressions after that shock. Because if we're resetting the electrical system, the plumbing system is still messed up. So, so we stopped CPR at that graph show. We lost all of our pressure now. And they shock, they continue compressions. And then they check later in the code. So We don't stop CPR until they grab us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, cool. It does. It definitely makes a difference. And honestly, electrical problems are a lot easier to fix uh, because you can reset the heart with electricity. Or, or say it's not from a cardiac arrest, but it's from just too fast of a heart. They have so much in their arsenal to make the electrical system behave. But once you get a clogged artery, then that's, that's a problem because you have actual dying of a muscle. You've got to get that reopened. So if you can get part of the heart going, and then the whole key is to get them to a revascularization center so they can do a, a cath or a bypass to get that, that, that part open. But electrical system is a little bit easier to, depending on the, the, what rhythm it's in. So. so the additional piece with the electrical system is do, as soon as they go into cardiac arrest, the treatment's the same, CPR and shocking them. So if it's an electrical problem that causes the arrest versus a, cl a, a clogged artery, the treatment stays the same. We still do compressions and we still shock them, try to get the rhythm back. Yes. And they will actually count for you and let you know what to do. That's the nice thing is they take the, they just want you to do the compressions. And so they'll actually have you count out. Or if you're not, they're like, we'll count for you. They're very good. They have very good protocols written that, that they'll guide you through it. Some phones, so say there are dead areas within the community where you just don't have cell coverage. And you can actually just get, there's apps online that you can just put on your phone and it'll count out for you the CPR. That's a good way to go with it. So, good reason to always have it. We uh, changed the way our dispatchers do things a little bit here versus what you might find in another big city. Uh, Doctor Hazen and I decided that we really wanted to know what they go through, so we went through the training, become certified dispatchers, and then came back and made some changes. So, 
what you will find across the country is they'll say, we'd like you to start CPR. Ours don't say that. They tell you, you're going to start CPR now. Are they on a hard, flat surface? And if not, then they'll have you pull them to a hard, flat surface if you're able to, and then they'll start giving you directions. So they don't give anybody a choice anymore. They just walk you through it, starting with put your hands in the center of their chest, push hard and fast at a rate of 200 a minute, and then they start going through. And um, we were able to make those changes and reduce our two minute or three minute dispatch time to the one minute doing those things. The other side of the, the last slide there, you see that it was three or four minutes before we started the, the CPR. The second dispatcher, as soon as we're, the fire department's turned off, is now giving directions. So we've actually re reduced that another two minutes. So you're getting CPR directions almost uh, simultaneously as us responding out. And it was interesting because it was a hard class. Like, <laughs> I went there and I suffered through this dispatch. It's not because, I mean, I enjoyed the class, but you know, if you have medical training, you want to ad lib. They're very structured. And so I wouldn't follow the cards and they're like, they'd start scoring me down. And I was taking it, I was, I was getting really stressed. Of all my classes, the dispatch class stressed me out the most because I wanted, I couldn't, you know, you, it's very structured and that's how they, that's how they're graded. And to let you know how the dispatchers score, they're averaging about a 97% rate on their directions. So that means they follow the card exactly as if minor deviations they get dinged for, and that's how they're graded. So everything has a quality component to it. So, you have a question? There, I, I understand that there used to be a time uh, in Los Alamos where if you dial 911, sometimes you get a local 911 dispatcher, and sometimes you get somebody in, in uh, Albuquerque. So we were trained to be is that still true? We've largely fixed the program. That pro we've largely fixed it. Yeah, yeah. Our, ours are in Santa Fe County. So um, if you do by chance get one, it's Santa Fe County now. So they'll give you the same directions as they're transferring to us. It only happens past the airport to the Twin Tanks is where we see the, the kick off to Santa Fe County sometimes. And it is actually considered Santa Fe County, although we're the closest responding unit, so we typically go to those calls. But they've largely fixed that program. And then we're doing a, a massive radio upgrade across the state that should eliminate that completely. Thank you. Any other questions at all? They, you can get a, a refurbished one for a few hundred dollars and they can range upwards of four or five thousand depending on how fancy they are and the colors. Uh, the ones that we uh, just had donated from the hospital, the Heart Council had two donated to the community. Uh, they were 2,500 each, 1,800 each. So th they're, they're the same ones that my staff carry in the, in the SUV trucks and all of our wildland units. So we're, we're very, very familiar with those and they're 1,800 a piece. And then there, there are a lot of brands. We use the Philips FRX is what we're using, but we're not stuck on any brand. Whatever works for the company. And there are some back-end associated costs when you do a defibrillator, like the batteries will expire. But used to, they were really, really expensive, and they really cut the cost down on the batteries, and the pads themselves will expire. And so whenever you start talking about those really expensive ones, like they're the ones that are designed that they work off a cell tower, so when the batteries start going low, they call the company, and you know that. So you can get as many bells. Some of them record the voices during that time, or you can program them. So that's why you can get it that high dollar. But but just a basic defibrillator is the way to go. And and uh, and, and there are you know there's many different avenues too. Like we like one of my goals was with. Um, I was trying to get Albuquerque to have the police cars to have the defibrillators, but like we're not going to buy all these defibrillators. Well, there's many different ways. If you look at a police car, you can say, well, look at it as an emergency package, just like their light bar. Well, you know, so you can have it built into the cost of a car. And so if your various agencies can do it, or if you have, say, you're a, a trucking company, well, build in the cost of your defibrillator into your trucks, because about the time of the life of the defibrillator is about the time of the life of a truck, usually, or a car. And so there's different ways to kind of justify a program depending on what your industry is. So. Well, I appreciate the questions. It's a good audience. Thank you guys for coming. It's, uh, it makes me happy that you guys are here, and I hope we can really affect the change. So, yeah. All right. Thank you.